Hello everybody and we welcome you to season 2 of Shifting Tides. Shifting Tides as you have already watched in last season is where we try and bring to you stories from people around the world who have had inspirational, motivational and transformative moments in their lives. And that moment led them to lead a life of higher purpose, a life where it was larger than themselves and which they had never comprehended before that. So today we are delighted to bring to you Dr. James Kusumano from Prague. Welcome James, welcome to Shifting Tides. Wonderful yes. to have My you. My pleasure. Here. My pleasure. Yeah. And um, I have read lots of material about you on the net and of course on your website. And what I discovered, and of course, even from our conversation, earlier conversation, you've done multiple things in your life. Yes. And, and you've been successful in almost everything. Now, yes. most of us, most of us and most of the people around the world, I can vouch to say that, that they just strive and go passionately towards one vocation and to make it a success. Uh -huh. So what is the secret mantra? <laughs> How did you manage <laughs> to do that? Well, um, the first uh, thing, the first secret is that my father was a very, um, how shall I say, disciplinary uh, Sicilian from Sicily. And he once told me when I was six years old, you can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I'm only kidding. He, well, he did do that. But um, I would say this, uh, all of the things I have done fall in, uh, in I would say, uh, uh, three categories. One is entertainment, the other is science and technology, and the third is business. And one way or the other, I have been in those areas because um, those areas speak to um, my strengths. We all have them. We all have certain strengths that we come into this world with. And fortunately, as a, a young boy, I was able to begin to see uh, the strengths that I had in those areas. And the second thing is that, um, like everybody else, I have had um, the, the um, fortunate uh, situation of having meeting various giants along the path of my life. By giants, I mean people who are smarter, more capable, uh, who care about me, who love me, and were giving me advice. Now, the only thing I could give myself credit for is listening to that advice, thinking about it, um, sometimes re rejecting it, unfortunately, but most times accepting it. And uh, in doing that, th that advice, you know, is uh, Isaac Newton, the very famous British physicist, used to say when somebody asked him, how could you be so brilliant and so incredibly successful in, in discovering the calculus and Newton's laws and gravitation? And he said, well, because I've stood on the shoulders of giants who've come before me. And I think we all have, can do that. We all can stand on the shoulder, shoulders of giants, but our only obligation is to listen and to see and then to be quiet and think. Let the information come in from those giants and then think, does that fit for me? Really go into your soul and answer it honestly. And when you do that, you may have two or three paths you could take. If you take the one that that intuition that comes from these giants tells you, your probability of success goes up exponentially. And that's really, um, I think being, I was kidding about my father, but being supported by uh, a family that loved me and told me, look, you can do anything if you put your mind to it. And if you're passionate about it and you take advantage of your skills and then meeting those key people along the way and listening to them and having them point me in a direction that would be beneficial for me and for the world. Because I hope my whole thing is what can I do that takes advantage of my strengths that will cause me passion to want to connect with something in the world, a need in the world that will make it even a little bit better. I don't have to be Mohammed. Uh, I don't have to be Gandhi. Uh, I mean, you know, or somebody like that who wants to change the, I mean, even if I change it a little bit, it, it's okay. It's okay. And that's what I, the way I've lived my life. Yeah. But the, but the ability to be able to, to 
to follow a giant and to be able to even spot a giant that's a huge opportunity yes. i mean that that is a that's the key and then what happens is when you start going along the path that they recommend or they say think about you begin to meet people that are very um complimentary to you uh for example I met uh, when I was just at a college and working as a research scientist, I met another scientist who became my very best friend and my business partner for life. I mean, basically. Okay. And he was a, a young uh, Jewish boy from uh, Ecuador, Ricardo Levy. And uh, he went to Stanford University, very smart, got a PhD in chemical engineering. And we met at, at, at uh, Exxon, where we were both doing working at the time, first job out of school. Okay. And um, and I, I think that meeting was incredibly important for him and for me because that allowed us to take a path w which led to both of us building together two companies in Silicon Valley, one of which grew in less than five years to a billion dollar company wow. with over 2000 people. And we, even us, we didn't do it because of our genius. We were able to attract people to us because of our passion for what we were yeah. going to do, uh, who were and, and smart, passion, smarter than us. Yeah, you know? and you have that passion, it exudes, and it's like a magnet, you know, then you attract all the kind of people. It is. Exactly. That, you know, uh, uh, Mahima, that's exactly right. That's that's exactly right. It, it draws people. Everybody wants to be part of a dream. Yeah. We, we all yeah. love to be part of a dream. Exactly. And so once one or two people have a dream and they paint it, even if it's a rough painting, and somebody sees that and they say, because secretly every single healthy human being in their soul, they want to make some kind of impact on the world. Totally. They, they, that's the, that's their main thing. They, they may say, I want to make a lot of money. I want to be a millionaire. I want to become president of this or that. But the real thing underneath all of that, the most important thing, if they're really quiet and listen, I want to do something that changes the world, even a little bit, even a small dent. That's true. That's true. And, and uh, with our program, which is titled Shifting Tides, people usually have one or two transformative moments in their lives, you know, which, which completely- well, what, kind of, what kind of moments? Transformative. Kind of moment? Transformative. Oh, yes, 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 or yes, yes. aha moments, as, as one could say. Yeah. So yeah, aha you've, moments. Had, you've had, what, I, what I, can, I can hear hear you say is that you've had multiple very strong phases in your life. Right. right. Which is very different from the other, each different from right. the other. So have you had those aha moments in each phase or have you had one such very impactful moment? Which I would say uh, I would say there were a number of them, but uh, some of them were much louder ahas than others, for example. And uh, a big one uh, came when I was working at Ex Exxon and I met Ricardo actually hired him, Ricardo Levy, into Exxon as a research scientist. And the reason I met him is he got his PhD with one of the consultants to our company, a very famous professor at Stanford. And um, so the professor at Stanford said to Ricardo and I once, you realize the field that you're working in, both Ricardo and I were working in what's called catalytic technology. A catalyst is something that speeds up a chemical reaction, okay? Now, the thing that was happening at the time is the technology and science was happening that would allow you to design a catalyst at the molecular level, which would increase its efficiency so that if you were feeding raw materials over the catalyst, you could, if you designed it properly, you could make these molecules come together in a more efficient way with almost no uh, e e ecologically toxic materials at a lower price, use less energy. So this professor said to us, you realize you're at a point where you're, you guys are becoming world experts in catalytic technology. You could probably create a, a, a company that would use that technology to begin to make products in a way that's more efficient and ecologically uh, mm -hmm. more favorable. And so Ricardo and I said, yeah, that's great. Except right now, which was back in 1974, there, we, 
the United States was in the midst of a huge um, uh, recession, 21% interest rates. It was really challenging. And so the professor said, well, you could start as consultants. And when the, wor- when the time changes, you could help other companies yeah. improve their technology. And when the world changes and venture capital comes back, you can raise money to create your own products. And all of a sudden, in Ricardo's, in my mind, aha, went on. And we left Exxon in the, with no, no job. We, we, we left really good jobs, got in our cars in New Jersey, and drove out to Silicon Valley, to Palo Alto, California, and we started a small wow. consulting firm. And the professor became one of our, uh, our partners. His name was Professor Michel Boudoir. He's now uh, deceased, but he was, a, he was a famous man in uh, academic science and catalysis. So he would open the doors for us, to companies and say, these two guys can come in and they can help you improve your products and save you money and uh, also make them ecologically better, which would be great PR for you. And so that's what we began to do. And we became famous as the two guys, as we hired more, even brighter people than us to come in and we formed a company called Catalytica Incorporated. And Catalytica was doing um, basically consulting for all of the giants around the world, pharmaceutical companies, oil companies, chemical companies, to help them do things better. So that that aha moment created a company uh, which allowed us to launch into an area that would then direct the future for us. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, And also um, uh, in your life, what I read, the situation, even if it was a, a, a very um, sad situation, like I think you mm-hmm. lost your wife, right? Right. That led you uh, to a place which was uh, which was beyond your comprehension, right? And then exactly. you exactly, and then you came to Prague. So could you just could you just uh, yeah. kind of, um, tell us as to how you saw? Um, a moment of turmoil as a yeah. moment of opportunity as well. You know? Very good, because this is also leads me to uh, another one of the cosmic laws that we should be aware of. And that is when the universe is good to you and it helps you do something, you should take whatever resources you have in, in a limited way, of course. I mean, I don't mean you should become poor, but you should try to help others. So in this case, my first wife, uh, her name was Jane. She was a screen a screenplay writer, and we had a daughter who was an actress then, Polly Cusimano, okay. and um, and she wrote a screenplay uh, called "What of uh, Ironically What Matters Most." Okay, wow. and she wanted to direct the movie, and it was an incredibly good screenplay. So I uh, had just sold my company, uh, Catalytica Pharmaceuticals in Silicon Valley, and we were living in Southern uh, California on a horse ranch, and I was trying to think, what am I gonna do next with my life? And I said, you know what? Um, Let's see what we can do with your movie, Jane. Her name was Jane. And uh, and so I took the, the, the screenplay to Paramount Pictures, and the, chairperson was a woman by the name of Sherry Lansing. She said, you know what, Jim, this is an extremely good screenplay, but you know, Jane has never directed a movie before, so we can't allow her to direct a movie for Paramount. So I said, all right. So I, we had money from selling our, the company, Catalytica Pharmaceuticals. I'm going to help her do her, follow her dream. So uh, we started a movie company called um, it was called uh, Chateau Wally Films because we had a, a place where we lived in California called Chateau Wally. And um, so she then found out, um, oh, just a couple of weeks before we moved to Texas to shoot the film on location. It was about a month and a half of shooting that she had stage four breast cancer. And she knew at that time um, there was no way she was going to beat it. It was too serious. That's what she was told by the world's experts at Stanford Medical Hospital. So I asked her what she wanted to do, and she said she wanted to direct the film. So she did while she was getting uh, chemotherapy. And it was a really tough time for her and for me. But 
she got the movie finished. Uh, she got to see it on the big screen at the studio. And then uh, she unfortunately passed away. And of course, it was extremely difficult for Polly and, and for me. But we ha uh, I said, look, we got to do something. We entered the film in a number of, of uh, film festivals, and it won in every one of them. It won wow. film. Wow. And so then I, I brought it back to Paramount and uh, Sherry Lansing said, Jim, this is a very good movie. You should really bring it to the largest uh, cable network company in the, in North America. And I brought it to them. They were called Lifetime. They are called Lifetime Television. Mm -hmm. And they took it and it became one of their best movies ever. Uh, and they mm -hmm. renewed the contract three times. And then it was redistributed. Everybody said, you know, you'll never get this distributed. And, you know, this is the experts telling you'll never get it. And yeah. uh, it, it got distributed in 50 countries uh, worldwide. So there's an example. I didn't have an interest of going into the movie business, but I have an interest in having my wife succeed at her dream. And, uh, and so we did that. It became a very significant success. Uh, it helped Polly's career. She then went on to become Polly Cole. She married a gentleman by the name of Joe Robert Cole. And Joe is a very successful director, producer, and screenplay writer. He wrote the screenplay for The Black Panther, which was uh, one of the world's largest oh, superhero wow. movies. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so, they're very, so you see how all of this has a path of, you know, you decide to do something willingly and, and it's fun helping somebody else and how the benefits come out of that. Then the, the other thing that came out of that, I, I sat for another year and a half in, in uh, Southern California at her home in a small village called Ojai, California, in near Santa Barbara. And I kept thinking, what am I going to do with my life? And I had a couple of offers to become a CEO of another uh, high-tech company, but I didn't really want to go back to it. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And one day in walks this to my home, this lovely, spiritual, beautiful blonde <laughs> by the name of Inez. And it, it happened uh, like instantly, my, my depression just evaporated. And I met, I didn't have any interest in getting married again, but I saw this woman and she, the way she spoke and she had, uh, she was the CE, she was living in Prague and was visiting a friend in California. And um, she had bought a rundown castle uh, in Prague and wanted to renovate it because she had expertise in the area. She was a CEO formerly of a heritage restoration company. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I don't know anything about castles, but let's do it. I got on the next plane. I went to Prague and I fell in love with her, fell in love with the castle. And we came back while we were planning for a couple of years, we were living in California and then ultimately renovated the uh, Chateau Mancelli, opened it in 2006 and it became a world famous a uh, luxury chateau uh, castle uh, hotel. And it's a green chateau. It's a green hotel. It is. Yeah, it was voted the, the world's leading green uh, uh, hotel in the world. What a story, Jim. What a yeah. story. And, but, but, you know, this is all of these things fall in place mm -hmm. because you do it for anybody can do this. If you do it for the right reason yeah. and you're passionate about it, yeah, I don't mean to tell you that it was a smooth road. No way. I mean, we had to work hard and there were hills and valleys, but the passion that you have for what you're doing and what you love somehow always makes you get up again. Just like now, there's a terrible situation in the Czech Republic uh, with the COVID virus, yeah. but I just know that somehow we'll get over it. I don't know all the solution, but I know because what we're doing is the right thing for the people that come to Chateau Metzeli because we try to do everything we can to make their lives better. And so I know that it's a really good thing. My wife is a very spiritual individual and dedicated to creating all kinds of spiritual things at the Chateau. So I know it will succeed. I don't know the answer, but somehow we just keep focusing our attention and our intention. And then we try to detach <laughs> from what, what the, how the universe will do it. We know it, we know the cosmos will make it happen. And you, you've uh, made a massive shift even in your personal life from being a scientist, having a science right. background to studying physical chemistry, right? To right. now writing, being an author of books like Cosmic Consciousness, Life is Beautiful. Right. So is that coming out of your personal experiences in life or is that yes. something which you completely believed in? 
No, no. Well, it's both. Uh, I I started uh, when we were building companies. Ricardo and I started thinking about what can we learn that would help to motivate people, that would get the best out of people. So it was a win-win situation, a win for the company and a win for them, not just well, how do you get the best out of employees. And so we experimented and hired all kinds of brilliant people to teach us about it. And one of the things that came out of that is that uh, consciousness is an extremely important thing. And when you start doing things for the right reasons and do it with a high level of consciousness that you take into account your connection with other people so that you want to do the best for them so that they can do the best with you. Um, it, it, uh, and so we developed a lot of mechanics that do that. Now, what happened is because of my background in entertainment, in science, in technology, in business, uh, in the all kinds of fields that I've worked in. I have a lot of material up here when I'm writing that allows me to write more credibly about yeah. certain aspects. And so I'm very excited. I, I like writing. I think since I was a kid, uh, my, my mother had this old typewriter and I used to write little essays on it uh, when I was uh, seven or eight years old. And I just liked writing. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget the very first thing I ever wrote. I wish I had it today to see what it says. It was called A Trip to Titan. Titan is one of the largest moons of Saturn, the planet Saturn. And I, I remember writing that. And so I've always had this bent. Or, and so I just has, have taken everything that I have learned along the way and try to mix it together in a way that makes it exciting. And I've also, um, I'm trying to write a, in a way that I, I haven't discovered, but something that, that speaks to me, I call it wisdom fiction. And that is, how do I write something that's exciting to the reader. They're reading this this thriller uh, about a, a spy and he's and then spies in Russia and there are all kinds of things espionage happening. But yet weave through the narrative some ideas about consciousness, about life purpose, about values, about free will, about these kind of. But don't do it in a preachy way. To try to do it in a way that's subtle. And that, I think, is a way that I can get my message out to a broader audience that will help them. And that's really my interest right now. Besides my family, my biggest life purpose is to take what I've learned and to try to help people find their life purpose and to create, uh, I, would, I would say, inspirational leadership. I think those are the two key things that would get the world out of the situation it's in. Inspirational leaders and people find, more people finding their life purpose. Yeah, yeah. And um, Jim, through your life, who do you think have been your influencers or role models in your life? Um, well, the, I have, I, I would say there's, <clears throat> there's two, two pieces there. First, I would de de describe influencers, okay? Because yeah. they're not necessarily my role, role models, but they were my influencers. One was my father yeah. who wanted me, yeah. uh, I, 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 he wanted me to become a physician. And I had no interest in becoming a physician, nothing against physicians, but it wasn't, it didn't speak to me, to my soul. But yeah. he thought he could convince me to become a physician. So for Christmas one year, when I was uh, 10 years old, he bought me a chemistry set and I discovered science. And I never wanted to do anything else but science. And I started making ink and uh, I started making glue and adhesives and all kinds of things. And then I discovered that I was an entrepreneur. I didn't think of it then. I started making these things, put them in bottles, and I was selling things uh, at, in school. And I was selling stuff in the, in the neighborhood perfumes oh, wow. and even though they were not very good, but I, I was excited about taking my technology, selling it, getting money back, not the money so much, but that somebody wanted to buy something I made. So I had discovered I'd like science and I liked, um, I liked chemistry or, and, and being an entrepreneur. The second person that had a major influence was my mother. And my mother was the one who said to me once, I'm the oldest of 10 children. My father worked for the, for the post office. My mother had, had a child every two years. So I'm the oldest. So my mother was pregnant for the first 20 years of my life. <laughs> and, and so we all, we all had a help. I had six girls and four boys. We all had a help at home because by any 
stretch of the imagination, we really didn't have very much money. So the boys would get, they would shine shoes or they would get a newspaper route or whatever. And I grew up in New Jersey and the cold winters of New Jersey were not fun for me. So my, my mother saw that I liked playing piano. I, I didn't have, I was playing by ear because my mother played piano and she had an old piano in the house and she would play and I would try to imitate her. I was about 10 or 12 years old. And she said, look, your dad has a friend who's a pianist uh, who has a band. He'll teach you some little tricks on music. And he did. Uh, Vince O'Brien taught me for two years on how to play pop music. You know, I didn't study classical music. And I started a band, started playing for parties, for weddings and stuff like that. And, and that helped me. I start bringing money home to help the family. And I could work inside, not in the cold New Jersey sure. winter. <laughs> and then ultimately, uh, this rec recording and, and during the uh, the 50s and 60s, and it was fun, but it was fun to do when you were a teenager, when you were yeah. young. I wouldn't want to do it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so those two people, they, they were influencers. Then there were, there were two people uh, along the way that uh, I would say three people along the way, no, four, who are, have, uh, have been role models. One is Ricardo, who's my business partner, yeah. and he's... Uh, exact complement of me. I'm the technology intuitive guy. He is the financial, legal, um, logical um, guy. And I, I, I learned a lot from him and he learns from me. And I have seen the synergy between the two. Plus we have the same values uh, in life. So that, that, that has, he has been the major. And I would say another one in my professional life has been a, a Dr. John Sinfeld who hired me into Exxon. And he was the first one that told me um, two years after I was working for him, he said, you know, Jim, you have much more than being a scientist. You can do much more than you want to think about what that is. Mm -hmm. And he was the one, one of the giants who led me to think that I could go beyond and I could become an entrepreneur. Yeah. And the third one, professor at Stanford who was more the academic guy and taught me to think analytically, which is not easy for me to do because I'm very intuitive. And then finally, I would say my, my current wife, Inez, is very bright and very spiritual. And so she constantly is very honest with me. When she, she reads something I'm writing, she will, in a nice way, tell me what she likes and what she doesn't like. And I know that I need to think about it carefully. Yeah, and so yeah. th those are those are the people that have had to date really big uh, influences on me and uh, and uh, and role models. I also have learned a lot from my children. I have three daughters mm -hmm. and their questions when they were young, especially I have now a, a, a 14 year old who'll be 15 uh, at the end of June. Her name is Julia. And the question she asks me and the statements she make makes to me make me think <laughs> I have to think my way through but it goes to show that you can always learn something and so absolutely here again these are all giants they're all giants you know yeah, yeah and your latest book I can see clearly can yeah. you tell us how that came about and if a little about that book yeah, well, it came about in this way. I, w I had written seven or eight books that were, uh, let me call it, how to, how to do it books, how to balance your life between your personal and your professional life, uh, how to live a spiritual life, how to learn more about meditation and consciousness. The, but they, and they were good books, but I started to ask myself, uh, how can I do this with a novel? And, and, and do it in a way that would make people interested to read the novel, but still learn about the same thing. And it wasn't an easy thing to do because you can't just uh, start saying, here's how you live a spiritual life. And then there's a spy from Russia coming in. I mean, it doesn't mix right. It has to be done very subtly. And so I wrote two novellas, which were okay. And I experimented with how to... Um, inculcate the ideas of that I had learned throughout my life into a novel, into the narrative. And it got better and better. And then finally, I went to school for three years online with uh, two people informally, uh, who, two women who were successful writers and at line editors and uh, developmental editors. Right. And they taught me how to, uh, how to write a good novel. And um, 
that that got me to the point where I was confident I could now do it. And that's when I began to write I Can See Clearly, which is a, a novel that does exactly what I said before. It, in, it uh, weaves throughout the narrative uh, some of the ideas I have on consciousness, on meditation, on values, on life purpose, and, and puts that in there in a way that's still exciting to read uh, the narrative, I think. At least that's what I've gotten from a number of reviewers. Great, great. And what are you working on currently? Any well, um, I, I, I just, yes, I decided uh, to make the uh, I Can See Clearly into a series, maybe at least three books. I don't know if it'll go beyond that. And I had just finished the first uh, 10 chapters, uh, no, tw 20 chapters of the second book, which is, and what I decided is that the first book is 375 pages. So it's a little bit long. And I decided all the books after that would be maybe 200 pages because I think people are so busy nowadays, they'd rather read a shorter, shorter book, but still with the same kind of material. So this book will be about 200, 225 pages. And I've just finished the first draft and I'm excited about it. It takes off from where book one ends because right. book one at the end uh, asks uh, something happens, which leads you to believe there's a future of, of events that are going to happen. And uh, it, that's what happens in book two. And so I'm excited about it. And uh, I'm going to probably after this, I would say, even though I have the first draft, it's a long way from publication, probably will be published in the fall. It would be okay. my guess. Okay. Okay. So uh, in the end, Jim, uh, what would you like to tell our viewers in terms of how can they bring about a change in their lives or how can they even foresee and, and in awareness bring about a positive change in their lives? Right. I, I would say to me what I have learned, um, and it's not always easy to get there, but you have to be committed to do the work. Yeah. And you want to get to the point where you can say, I do what I love and I love what I do. Yeah. Now, I, that's the way I feel about writing now, but it's not easy to get there. I don't want to say that there's a formula which gets you there in the, in you know a couple of weeks. The key I have discovered is the following, and I'll, I'll try to summarize it in a few minutes. First, I believe, and I'm absolutely convinced that every single one of us, you, me, and everybody, every normal, healthy person is born with some sort of asset inside. And in the early on, they may find out what it is. It, it, it may be a, a hard asset like science, math, uh, um, it might be sports, or it might be finance, whatever. And or it might be a, what I call a soft asset, which is also very important, leadership, compassion, love, uh, understanding, and sometimes a combination of those. So what I think a person, what I could, would say to our, our viewers, it's important for you to understand that there's something inside of you that's important and it's, it, it, can be, it can be used to do something in this world. And so once you discover what that is, what you're good at, don't worry about how you're going to have it, what your job is going to be. What are you good at? And then the next piece is the, is the hardest piece of all. And that is to say, okay, I'm, a, I'm good at communications or I'm good at sports or I'm good at math or whatever, whatever it is. How do I connect that with a need in the world that makes it just a little bit better and look at lots of different possibilities. Don't get discouraged. And you, eventually if you are really intent on finding that you absolutely will find it. And when you find it, that creates passion. Oh my God, I can take my skills in math and do this, or I can take my skills in sports. You know, you can take your skills in sports. You don't have to go to the Olympics. You can open a sports store. You can become a sports representative. You can do all kinds of, you can become a coach. So you need to think about what can I do with the capabilities I have? And once you do that and you discover something you want to do, the universe will help you get there. It, it, it wants you to succeed and you'll get that passion. And once you have that passion, what I can tell you happens is it creates tremendous energy and energy, both physical energy and emotional energy. You will even sometimes forget to eat lunch. Yeah, that's, that's how excited you are about what you're doing. Yeah. And, and when you have that energy, uh, it will lead to a type of creativity you've never seen before in your life. All of a sudden, the left and right brain the linear, uh, let's say, um, 
let's say, analytical part of your brain and the intuitive part of your brain will be connected. And you'll be able to solve problems you never thought you could solve before. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, it will lead to innovation. That means something new that you can do that will make a difference. And when you do that, you'll start getting rewards. And the rewards can be psychological, emotional, spiritual, financial, almost always. When you do something that you're good at and you love to do, you will make enough money to live a comfortable life. I can't guarantee you'll be a billionaire, but who cares? If you're happy and you're living a comfortable life, that's all that matters. And that, that to me, I think is, so seek your life purpose by listening. And then also when these people come along in your life, these giants who advise you about things, at least listen. Don't let it go in one ear and out the other. Listen to what that person said. Think about it in moments of quiet and see, does it make any difference? And if it doesn't, okay, throw it out. But if it does, think about how you can use it. So that that would be my advice. And I think those are the reasons, if I had any success, it's been that. And I think also never be afraid if you become in the position of hiring people, never be afraid to hire people who are smarter than you in, in an area that you don't know anything about. Because exactly. that's what leads to And people to success. don't do that because of their own insecurities. I think yes. we have to rise yeah. above that, yeah. Yeah, learn to love yourself for what you are, not what you think you should be. You know, That's love true. yourself for what you are. Yeah. You know, so That's true. That's true. Wonderful. So on that note, we'll say goodbye for now. That sounds great. That sounds great for me. And it was a pleasure chatting with you. Hope that we can speak again sometime in the future. Absolutely. And I wish you the greatest of luck happiness and fulfillment as you proceed in your life because you're just a young lady and I think you have a lot of lives ahead of you. <laughs> well, <laughs> we never know. <laughs> Thank you anyways. Thank you, Jim. Thank my, you. My, my pleasure. Talk. And we'll, we'll talk to you again. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Jim. Bye. So that was Dr. James Kusumano. I hope you all enjoyed listening to him as much as I enjoyed talking to him. And the takeaway for me today is that we all are born with an innate, unique talent. And our life journey actually is all about discovering that. And I do hope that this interview has urged you all to really look within and find out where is your life taking you? What is it that you would passionately like to pursue? So with that, we come to an end of today's episode. Do look out for our next episode and don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel. Goodbye.